morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. I'd like to get started first by wishing you a very happy holiday season. Um, and I'm look, looking forward to the topic tonight. I'd like to thank Clark County Credit Union, who is our sponsor of the Neighborhood Health Series, and remind you that we'll be back in January with our series kicking off with Financial Fitness, brought to you by Clark County Credit Union. Just like to let you know that right now I am recording um, this um, presentation, which you can find on the speakers.roseman.edu site, and you can share with anyone. All of our recordings are housed there, as well as our upcoming schedule. So now let's get going into our topic of arts and healthcare and medicine. Um, this is um, really a very special topic. Our newest campus, which is our Summerlin campus, just thought it'd be interesting to mention that um, our Summerlin campus is home to several of our clinical practices, both Cure for the Kids Foundation as well as the Empowered Program. And our designers, when they set out to design these buildings, and there are three of them, um, looked very carefully at how to integrate arts in the design of this building, these buildings. Um, not only is there a museum quality contemporary art collection of mounted art, there's also sculpture as well as healing spaces, reflection gardens, and water features. Um, I'm lucky enough to sit on this campus as is Dr. Gillis, and I certainly feel the healing effects all the time of that very intentional design in these buildings and in this campus. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marin Gillis, Senior Executive Dean of Faculty Affairs and Learning Innovation. Dr. Gillis is a philosopher, bioethicist, and award-winning medical educator. She is dedicated to advancing innovative applications of creative, conceptual, and critical thinking aimed at an empowered, resilient, inclusive learning environment and workforce, and better health out outcomes for patients, households, and communities. Dr. Gillis is an internationally recognized leader in education and the health professions and serves as director of the USA Working Group and director of international academic affairs for the Cambridge Consortium for Bioethics Education. She co-founded the Ethics and Humanities Educators in the Health Professions Affinity Group at the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities, where she served as co-chair and is also a Harvard Macy Scholar. Dr. Gillis is the P1 of a flourishing digital humanities lab called purplecoat.org and has published in the area of ethics and medical biotechnologies, but she's more recently devoted to the scholarship of medical and interprofessional health education. She served a three-year term on the steering committee for the American Association of Medical Colleges Group on Women in Medicine and Science, and as the Assistant Dean for Women in Medicine and Science at FIU University and College of Medicine, where she was also a division chief and the founding faculty advisor for the Gold Humanism Honor Society. She has held academic and administrative positions at the University of Nevada School of Medicine in Reno and the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences University in Boston. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gillis. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And thank you everybody for joining um, us this evening. And we're going to be talking, or I'm gonna be introducing some themes in um, what has become uh, one of my most favorite and heartfelt um, aspects that I've been able to develop in my career in medical education. And that's um, learning about uh, the importance and value that the arts can bring to healthcare. Um, so I'm going to be first, uh, I wanted to say in Vanessa's introduction that you mentioned Purple Coat and it's apropos of tonight, not just because of our new background, Vanessa, but um, Purple Coat comes from an organization of students in England who are medical students and medical students are known for their white coats. And it was an arts and, and humanities student group and they said they called themselves the Purple Coats. So that's where the name of that digital humanities lab comes from. Um, so first I have no financial relationship with any commercial interest related to the content of this presentation, although I will be talking about some uh, examples of, of some things, but I, I have no commercial interest in any of them. Um, and I'd also like to extend my thanks to the Clark County Credit Union for sponsoring this amazing series that we have so that we can share uh, our research and what we're passionate about with the people of Las Vegas. So this evening, I'm going to be talking about some trends in the arts and medicine movement. 
I'm going to be giving you some examples of ways in which engaging the arts and humanities can have a benefit for patients, as well as providers, and enhance the quality of life of everyone. And I'm going to describe narratively how the arts applies to everyday medical practice and personal resilience. And one of the mantras that I have, and this is working with humanism and medicine, and it's come, going to become particularly evident in my presentation tonight, is that when we're talking about humanism in, in, in medicine, we're talking about treating, you know, the humanity of patients and their families, but also the radical idea that providers are, are humans too. So health humanities, sometimes you hear it referred to as medical humanities, but we're trying to talk about it as health humanities to involve all the disciplines in the health professions is broadly construed to refer to like, you know, academic pursuits like um, history of medicine or, you know, literature and medicine, philosophy, and this is what my background is in. So there's philosophy of medicine and ethics, like healthcare ethics, uh, religious studies in medicine, you know, about uh, uh, different kinds of sacred, sacred parts of healing, uh, sociology, of course, anthropology, and the visual and performing arts. And if anybody's an academic, you're looking at that and going, my gosh, that's a whole bunch of different kinds of things under the heading of humanities, and you're right, but that's, that's just broadly construed how folks see this. And my first position as a director of medical humanities was when I was at the University of Nevada School of Medicine, which at the time, you know, included Vegas and Reno and Elko. It was a state university medical school before it split into just to Reno and, and um, um, Las Vegas. Uh, that was my first job as a director of medical humanities. And, you know, I'm an academic, I, I'm a philosopher. I, I do philosophy medicine, um, you know, critical thinking in medicine, obviously biomedical ethics, clinical ethics. And I knew about the other history, you know, the disciplines in the humanities, but what I didn't know anything about was arts and medicine. And so that was back in about 2005, 2006. So I really went all out to find out about what this was and how it could work. And I really learned a lot of different things. And so there's one aspect of that I've learned about arts and healthcare and arts and medicine, but it's another thing. And this is what I was very much concerned with was arts in health professions education. So how we can use the arts when we're training young healthcare professionals. And that was my particular interest, but I learned a lot along the way. And I also got involved with a lot of organizations. And in fact, when Vanessa was mentioning this campus, I was actually brought to this campus when I worked, you know, based in Reno to look at the art collection, you know, because it was a superior art collection in a healing space and the gardens. And um, it's always been, uh, uh, always stayed with me. And I, I just can't believe my luck that I'm now working in this very same campus. So, Broadly construed, it's everything. I care about it in general with healthcare, but in particular, um, uh, medical education. And so why the humanities in this broadly construed way and why are we including things like anthropology and sociology and the arts in it is that we're talking about this whole group of, of dif disciplines and fields as a gateway to human experience and values. And being in the healthcare and a healing space and a sick space, a lot of what it means to be a human being and what a human being values comes to the fore. So this is usually the typical response I would get when I would, you know, give uh, presentations at the medical school about the needs to include the need to include arts in the medical school curriculum. And so I, I always have. I, I'm not being defensive about it, but I just always have in my mind anytime I speak about it that I do have uh, work to do to explain why it is that it's relevant. And the first story I'm going to get into is in medical education, and it is one of the, the first things that started to be published with the arts in medical education. And it was interventions that were being held with um, uh, uh, arts curators and health profession students, in particular medical students I'm going to be speaking of, but I am going to get into an interprofessional intervention. And it was bringing the medical students into art galleries and being shown to look at the paintings and shown to look at art. Um, professionally, like by people who can teach us how to see things. And I don't know, I'm sure folks in the audience can, can, can recognize this. Like, I mean, you go to a gallery, let's say, and you say, well, I can see things, I can look at things. And a lot of times when, when people have studied this, folks look more, they spend usually more time looking at the title or the little you know, explanatory guide on things in the art gallery, not the, not the uh, painting, let's say itself. And 
I've known myself that I've seen particularly famous works of art, but after having taken a guided tour, or I did take one art appreciation class and as an undergraduate student, I was taught to see things that even when I was looking at them, I'd never seen that before. So the first published study with regard to having medical students in the art space was a, a Yale study from 1993. And, what, and Yale has a, 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 a gallery of uh, British art and they had, uh, they took, they, 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 they did this intervention and they usually do this kind of thing, right? Like they had 30 students, they divided them up into two groups of 15 and they gave the all the students like uh, uh, an exam a with recognizing certain things in dermatology, like, you know, certain kinds of, of lesions, certain kinds of uh, skin diseases. Uh, and they had to look at, like, you know, have slides of the diseases and had a little quiz on it. And they got the baseline for the results for all the students. And then they took half of the students and they did this intervention in the art gallery where they went and looked at paintings. They weren't looking at, at slides. They weren't looking at derm slides. They were looking at paintings in a gallery and a curator was going through with them. And they did their intervention. It was like a couple of times a week for a couple of weeks. I think it was five weeks, once a week. They went and did this, this intervention to look at paintings with the curator. And then they brought all the students together again, again and gave them a similar kind of exam. And the students, the 15 students who had had the, the art intervention did remarkably better on the second test than the students who hadn't. So there was something about being taught to see, like to being taught to observe that was, in, that was important that, and transferred to looking at other things. So the conclusion was that this kind of intervention improved visual diagnostic uh, skills in medical students. And the, the dermatology folks were, were interested in this, but as you can imagine, there's other fields of medicine where it's very important to have a visual you know, acuity and that's in radiology. So the radiologists started to get on board with this. And then all over the country, like in New York in particular, in Baltimore, and also in Boston, these interventions were starting to be developed. Um, and it was uh, in about 2008, and um, it was uh, in the, the annals, um, gosh, what was it? The Journal of General Internal Medicine um, did a study and it was uh, with uh, Harvard students and they were working with um, der dermatology and radiology and they did a big study and they published it. And you know, once Harvard did it, then it was okay for anybody else to do it, right? So we were really happy with that study. But as I said, a number of universities have been doing it for a while. So there are those interventions. So you're trying to develop very specific skills, which is the art of observation to transfer it to something else. Now there's another set of museum um, interventions with medical students and health profession students that was going on. And this was in New York City at a museum called the Frick Museum. And the Frick has a big collection of portraits. This is one of the things besides the furniture and stuff they, that they're known for. They also have a collection of portraits. And this picture, this photograph is of a woman named Amy Herman. And I met her at, at, a, at, a, at an arts and medicine conference. And what she was doing was uh, with, because they had these, these faith, you know, these portraits of people, she was teaching something to get, I guess you'd call it to understand emotional intelligence. So she was doing arts of ob observation, but she was doing it particularly to determine um, what the facial expressions meant. So it was like to pick up on visual cues from the faces, what people were going through, or just from their safe, or from their body language, what was going on. So it was developing emotional intelligence. And so it was an improved observation of human emotions and faces and body language. And this is a painting that, or a slide of a painting that I've used before teaching it just to show, you know, when you ask the students, like, what do you think, you know, what kind of emotion is being portrayed here? And, and, and why do you think that? So they'd have to point to different parts of, of the, the representation because that was giving them their cue to what they thought of as the emotions that were being portrayed in this painting. And Amy Herman was so successful that she left her job at the Frick. And if you notice on the last line, it said the art of perception and there was a little trademark. That's her business now is that she does these trainings. And interestingly enough, it wasn't just for the medical students in, in, in the New York area that, that were filtering through the Frick for this rotation. 
she started to teach um, the FBI and the CIA and the, um, the New York City police because they too really need to know uh, the art of observation and uh, had develop an emotional intelligence. And now she's written books on it. And, um, and, and as I said, she's been able to make a livelihood, a thriving livelihood uh, to, to, to teach these skills. The third kind of intervention that's been used with art galleries and medical students and health profession students, it comes out of the museology world and it's called the visual thinking strategies or VTS. And VTS is like, it's very, very codified. Like this is something that's being used a lot in, um, in grade schools, like for, for, for with, 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 with young students, uh, but it has been adapted into the medical realm as well. And the VTS, like, I mean, you have to be trained as an official VTS trainer in order to be able to do VTS. And it, it's, it's really is quite an industry, but it's really quite fascinating that it's something that's so powerful can come down to uh, a facilitation with the group with the following three questions. And this is like the VTS methodology. So they'll focus everybody's attention a small group onto one painting or, you know, it's usually paintings and they, it's like what, and they ask these questions, what is going on in the picture? And so people will respond. What do you see that makes you say that? And then the third question is what more can you find? And I've been in situations like when the first time I did this as a noon, uh, uh, a noon um, uh, activity at a medical school, and, you know, so people who were interested, it was a self-chosen thing. People were not required to do this. And it was interesting and there's free food, right? So medical students come and we had a trained VTS person in there just to go through a little VTS exercise. And I didn't know what was gonna happen. And it was amazing that, you know, one painting with these three questions could lead a really robust conversation, an interactive conversation with students for about 25 minutes on just one painting. And it was extraordinary. It was, it was just extraordinary. So um, the University of Miami School of, of Medicine and Health Sciences, uh, they actually have a gallery at, at the University of Miami, it's called the Lowe, and they, they have an entire wing that's just dedicated to VTS. And it's VTS for an interprofessional health, an interprofessional education intervention. So students from physical therapy, medicine, nursing, Etc. cetera, it's a, it, they do small groups together uh, as part of their BTS, uh, BTS um, uh, instruction. And so it's being used as also an interprofessional health education intervention for team building and uh, at the University of, of, of Miami. And so the methodology in BTS is that, you know, as I said, this is a very well, uh, well thought out methodology is that all students, you have to have a really good facilitator. That's why you have to be trained in this. Um, and everybody gets a chance to speak. Everybody is getting positive affirmations. Um, but the really interesting thing about it is that when students like will say, like maybe they'll recognize a famous painting or they'll recognize a theme in the painting. And so they'll start to talk about that. And the, and the facilitator's job is always to take them back to the materiality of the painting. Right, and say, well, that's very interesting, but what do you see and why do you get to say that? You know, what is it in the painting that's letting you say that? So the outcomes for this, and this has been studied as well, is that students are taught how to communicate collaboratively, disagree respectfully, and observe objectively. It's not just an observation and I'm making a statement about what I see and that you're supposed to believe me because of how much power I have in this conversation. No, you keep on referring back to the object itself. So you're observing it objectively in the sense that you're, you're pointing to the object to justify what claim that you're making about it. Um, using teamwork to find a collective truth and problem solving and problem finding. And this was just from a study uh, that was published in uh, the journal of uh, Teachers of Family Medicine. Um, and they did an intervention using residents. And uh, I, I think it's really powerful and telling that uh, the kinds of comments that came up with it and um, to say like, you know, the painting became richer because different eyes focused on different things. And this one in particular was my brain passed over things that others brought to my attention. The painting didn't change, but my perception of it changed through the process. And that just shows you how important it is in collaborative work to make clear what, you, what, what it is that you're perceiving by pointing to like the, the features that are making you say that. So it's again, not just because I'm saying it, it's because this is what I'm getting from what I'm seeing in front of me. 
so with the arts and observations, like, like, the, like I gave you three different interventions that are being used around the country and the world, but these are the ones that I'm particularly familiar with in the States and the people who are doing them, um, is that they're there to develop observation skills, they're there to develop emotional intelligence, teamwork, communication. Um, and as I said, they've been really uh, well done in different places. You usually just have to have an art gallery um, and, uh, and then and you have to have somebody who's trained in, uh, in art curation or like, you know, doing these kinds of things in order for it to work. The next um, uh, uh, part of health humanities that's been incorporated into health professions education is something called narrative medicine. And this is a photograph of the founder of narrative medicine. Her name is Rita Sharon, and she's an MD PhD out of Columbia uh, Medical School in New York City. And um, she has a really interesting story. And when I heard her story, I was really twigged and tuned into it. And her story is that she's a physician and she just loved reading and writing. She just, that was just her thing. She was a really great reader. She loved fiction. And she started to notice, and she says this, you know, anytime she's asked, um, that she said when she was dealing with her patients, when she was having these interviews with her patients, she said, getting to know a patient was like reading a story. You know, it really reminded her, and she wanted to know what was going to happen next, or this is how she was thinking about it. So she really started to, to think about this and work with it. So she went to NYU to get a master's degree in English, which, you know, just warms the cockles of a person who has a PhD in humanities who's in medical education's heart, that a physician thought she could be a better physician if she took a graduate degree in a humanity. And even better with the story, she thought that a master's degree wasn't enough and she had to go back and get a PhD, which she did. And her doctoral dissertation was turned into her first book called Narrative Medicine. So she actually has developed techniques for medical students because this is just, you know, on one hand, it's just like, it's a way to get into patient-centered communication. And she said, but by seeing folks as, as a story and, and looking at it as a story, it's gonna help. So she has three moments of narrative medicine. And the first is, um, attending, she calls it. like So that is like paying, you know, it's, it's active listening. It's listening to the patient. And she would always ask her patients, the first question was, what is it about you that's, that's important for me as your doctor to know? And then the patient would just start telling a story, you know, about what it was about them that it was important for her to know. And the next move was for her to represent it. And that's the second movement in narrative medicine is representation. So she would write down the story that the patient had said, and then she let the patient look at it to say, if I got this right, you know, am I, am I getting your story right? And they could correct it if they wanted. And this became part of their charts. And they would revisit it every time. And she said like, you know, and that's what I would read before every, you know, every time I saw a patient, I'd always read this, the last, you know, narrative uh, note that we wrote together and then she believes that through this attention and through this representation that there'll be affiliation you know there'll be an affinity a tighter affinity between the provider and the patient and she also thinks that narrative medicine um, uh, techniques like she has parallel charting exercises she has this particular exercise she also thinks it's very important for health providers to be engaged in this as well and now at Columbia, like this, star, she started this, gosh, it was like in the middle of the two, like 2005 is when I first found out about it. Um, and now there used to be a three day narrative medicine um, workshop that was held at Columbia. And I was able to get a couple of faculty members to go attend it. Now there's a master's of science at Columbia University in narrative medicine. And there's also graduate certificates in narrative medicine. And I've helped a couple of physicians uh, uh, get involved with this and be successful in getting these cert certificates. Next, to get on the writing end of it is writing for professional development formation. And a number of medical schools um, have these and they're arts and humanities journals that medical students have themselves. And it's their own essays, their own writing. Sometimes at the medical school, like when I was at Reno, um, they had one called the stethoscope and they, they asked for uh, uh, submissions from all members of the community at the medical school. And, but at this particular one at FIU, which I, I, I helped uh, initiate, um, the medical students over again uh, just wanted it for themselves. And then because of our program with interprofessional teams, it extended to, uh, there's a section that just talks about that, like that, 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 that time um, in the communities. There's a special section of this journal that has this, that they invited the other health professions as well. 
And um, so El they, they named it themselves because the first, uh, uh, the first editor, um, she was a medical student. She's now an ER doc in Broward County in Florida, but she had been a classics major as an undergraduate and a biology minor. And so she named it like an eloquor means to be eloquent. Um, and it was, it, it just took off and they made it themselves. It, it, you, they had essays, poetry, fiction, thoughts. They would have drawings that they did or photographs of artworks that they did. And it is, it, it is just a wonderful thing to have for all sorts of reasons. Um, here's another intervention that I worked with uh, to help develop skills for medical students. And it was called Drawing for Informed Consent. And um, this was using just basic, basic drawing skills. And we were teaching them to students so that um, uh, as a form of communication, and if we looked at drawing and, and pictures as forms of communication, that this would be a really good way to be able to get folks to understand something about interventions, particularly in those communities where, um, where English might not be a good first language. And we had, we had this uh, intervention published. And this reminds me too, when we talk about medical students not drawing, this is a former student of mine, and this was from his anatomy notes. And so we used this as an example when we were talking about like how it was that pictures communicate so that color communicates and you know uh, you can draw motion you know so here are the hands moving back and forth or the you know flexing the the the, the, the fingers up and down um, and and other expressions and so this fellow as well went into emergency medicine um, and he's now an emergency medicine physician in Orlando um, Oh, the next one for medical school, this is improv, improv, people who do comedy improv, people who do acting improv are being, they're doing interventions with medical students. And again, it's a way of developing communication skills and also really good listening skills. Because one thing that improv folks know really well when they're taking things that say from the audience to, to enact something for them, they have to really pay close attention to what's being said. And they also have to act quickly in the field. And uh, this is at the University of Wisconsin, um, the Medical School of Wisconsin, Medical College of Wisconsin uh, uh, did this first, but I've also heard of other places that are using, using it now. Next is something, and this started at, at Penn State Medical School, um, uh, uh, using comics in medicine, but graphic, and it's called graphic medicine. And, and, and this is used like by medical students, but it's also used by other folks to, to diagram the first person experience of medicine, either being a medical professional and Ian Williams is from England and his The Bad Doctor has been translated into so many different languages because it really resonates with many people. Um, the Cancer Vixen was one of the first cancer narrative, graphic narratives that came out. Um, so it's again, um, being able to represent through pictures uh, the first person experience of being in the health professions or having a certain kind of disease and it's a really nice mediated way to get in and it's just taken off and um, the first course that I knew that was using comics to help medical students um, was at, at, at Penn State at, at Hershey, Pennsylvania. Now that being said, like so that's arts that you know has been incorporated into medical education so the outcomes are to make uh, the medical students and you know, interprofessional health students develop skills that are gonna help them be healthcare professionals. But there's another part of arts and medicine that other folks might be more familiar with. Excuse me, and this is arts as therapy. And there's a whole realm of art therapists. And like I say to folks, like this is when you have degrees and certifications, like this is a kind of allied healthcare. This is, this is uh, in usually in hospitals, it's in clinics as well. Um, it's in rehab facilities. And so you have to be certified in order to do these kinds of things. And the outcomes are therapeutic. The outcomes, you know, we do want people to be artists, but the, the outcomes in art therapy are uh, clinical outcomes. So you, you go to school, you get graduate degrees, you have to be certified, um, you can bill in hospitals. Uh, so one of them, the first one that we all know is art therapy. And this is an approach to psychotherapy and counseling, but it's also used as an aid to diagnose certain neurological conditions. And I put an example here of the clock drawings and the clock drawings are, it's when folks are asked to draw a clock and they'll give you, you know, a time that you should draw. And this was from an article that was uh, looking at the clock drawing of somebody who was diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's 
and they, you know, what their clock drawing looked like at six months, 12 months, and 18. So the clock drawing was, was used as a determinant for some neurological conditions. And this is of the things that art therapists do. So it's not just um, psychotherapy and counseling. It's also used to diagnose certain neurological, it's, it's an aid, it facilitates diagnosis. There's also music therapy. Again, you have to go to music therapy school at university to get this, and then you, you also have to be certified. There's physical, cognitive, and behavioral aspects to it, that that's what they address. Um, again, it's psychotherapy and counseling, but it's also used for rehab and sensory and motor function. And it could also be expressive in the sense of, uh, of getting uh, singing, songwriting, all sorts of things. And it's in music therapy in particular, because there were, you know, in a lot of hospitals, there was music intervention. And the music therapists always had to say, like, you know, you cannot go to bedside with music unless you're a trained therapist, because in music, so many things can come out of people um, uh, when they hear certain music. And I know some folks in Reno who uh, uh, sponsored uh, uh, music to be performed in memory care homes. And people with dementias, um, do have aesthetic responses to things, but in particular, there's a real resonance with music, particularly when you play music from the time when they, when the folks, the population at the home, the general, like, where, whatever those folks were of a certain age, like when they were young, when they were teenagers, if you play music like that, there's very strong reactions to that. And so if you're not trained to deal with this, this could be very, this, this could be very, um, uh, uh, very, very difficult to, to, to deal with. So they don't want folks who have not been trained as therapists involved with these kinds of spaces. Expressive arts therapy is another form of art therapy. Again, it's, it's a certification program and it uses more, um, it, it, it's more of a general um, arts therapy using music, theater, poetry, dance, everything in it together, again, as a therapeutic tool. Then there's dance therapy, and one of the most famous um, kinds of dance therapy is uh, uh, dancing therapy for people with Parkinson's disease. And um, that's been uh, a phenomenon that's gone worldwide. Um, in particular, this is doing the tango. That was the first one that was introduced and having folks learning how to do the tango who were, who were, for, who were uh, uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's. And again, it was... Um, uh, it, it has a therapeutic end in like more of an occupational therapy way, like, you know, for balance and things like that. But it also promoted social and economic or sorry, social and emotional strength as well. So the, 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 the arts therapies are a particular kind of health profession. They are they are allied health professionals. They get certified. Uh, they can bill. And that's different from just other kinds of arts interventions that are meant to just generally improve the quality of life. And this is a project that was uh, done in Chicago called the Unlonely Project. And it was there was something about making art with others and sharing and talking about that was just a quality of life indicator. And it was just it was just a good human thing to do. And you've seen I've seen projects like this. There was one that was done at three different uh, medical schools across the country to get medical students introduced to geriatric populations because first year medical students have um, uh, uh, studied, um, uh, they're, not, they're not excited about, uh, generally they're not excited about, about this population because they don't think they have much in common with them. And so these folks, it was in Baltimore and in Chicago and two other places, I can't remember, but they, again, got a, like 30 medical students and divided them up into two groups, gave them, there's a, 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 a survey that exists that uh, talks about uh, uh, relationships with people who are older and with questions, things like, I have a lot in common with somebody who's over 75, I, you know, things like that. And so they took half of the students and made an art program at the local, uh, or one of the local um, art galleries and they put the medical students together in teams with, with elders, and they had to make art projects together. And the same kind of thing, you know, it was to uh, share and talk about what they made together to present, to have something in common. And as you can imagine, the students who had that, that time with their elders, when they redid the test, they had much different outcomes, you know, about how much they had in common and how they could relate to people who were older. Now, here's another intervention, and, and these folks from MoMA, 
Um, when the folks from OMA came to Renown for a CME at lunch, that was the most interesting uh, lunch, uh, lunch medical presentation I'd ever seen. Um, but there's a program at MoMA called Meet Me at MoMA, and MoMA is the Metropolitan, uh, sorry, it's a, a modern museum of art in, in New York City. Um, and they have this great program, and it's designed for people with dementia, because I, I, I mentioned earlier before that people with dementia have aesthetic responses. And so they, they just made sure that the gallery was really quiet. They did it on Mondays. That's the day that most galleries are closed. And they brought the people with dementia in and their caregivers. And it was just this amazing uh, time that, that people had together to talk about art. So they weren't having to answer questions about things. There was nothing medical about this at all. It was just a very enjoyable afternoon. Um, and it was something that people could do together. Uh, and uh, there's a fellow here, he said, I realize that once you have Alzheimer's, you don't know if your memory is correct, but the program gave me confidence to know that I've been able to retain my appreciation of art. And here's another, uh, this is a woman who's a theater professor, her name is Ann Basting, she's out of Wisconsin, and she's written a number of books, um, like, you know, Forget Memory, Try Imagination was her first book, now she's written one on creative care, but she started, she's a theater professor, and years ago, she started a, a program called Sl Time Slips at memory care homes. And it was, um, uh, uh, it, it's an approach to creative storytelling. It's a group storytelling approach. And these, there's little like nuggets here that I had. So they would have like these photographs and there's a little thing here saying her name might be, you know, Gloria Jean, she looks so happy. And then somebody else in the group would add a line to the story. So they would make the people at the home would be facilitated by somebody who's been a time slips trained facilitator. And they would go through these, these, these uh, uh, what people's impressions were and what the picture reminded them of to tell stories. And she was like, I think it was in 2016, she was uh, given a MacArthur Genius Prize or she was recognized for her amazing creative work with dementia care and elder care using theater um, by the MacArthur program. And this is another intervention. And this was um, uh, uh, it, this is a painter called William Untermolen. And he's an American painter who went to Britain for most of his, his career. And he was a figurative artist, which wasn't a, a, a like in the 60s and the 70s, that was a really big, you know, it was pop art and op art and things like that. So he wasn't really known because figurative arts weren't, you know, really, in, like they weren't looked at as, as more interestingly than um, at that time. But he, he did this. And anyway, in, in, in 19, in the mid 90s, he was diagnosed with dementia that was probably Alzheimer's. And so he made a commitment to himself and his wife that what he would do uh, as, as a, almost like a meditation on this was that he would do self portraits of himself until he couldn't do it anymore. And there was a neurologist that worked with him because they were giving, like giving him, like they were looking at like taking scans of his brain to see if they could find anything that was interesting that would correlate to the, the, the representations that he was going to. And it was around 1998, like, you know, you see the, 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 uh, the dates on these, on these images. It was around 1998, 99, that he started to lose his ability. Like he didn't know who he was. He couldn't name himself. He couldn't um, uh, uh, speak about himself, but he could still draw himself. And this is a very compelling art exhibit. And I had the amazing fortune to get uh, Nevada Humanities and Nevada Arts Council grants to bring this to, to the University of Nevada School of Medicine. And we had, you know, it all chronologically laid out these different things. And it was so compelling to see by right before he died, and that's 2000, you can see how his self-representations had changed. And the lastly, with Alzheimer's, this is a, a local group that I was involved with um, called Moments of Memories. And this is art making with people with dementia. And uh, so an art, uh, uh, she was an art teacher and she, um, her father developed Alzheimer's and she was taking care of him and she just wanted something for him to do that he could enjoy. And this is such a moving program. So Lynette Schweiger is the name of the woman who developed this and it's called Moments of Memories. And what would they would do is that the folks would, would make like she would give them these no fail art projects. And I put the bunnies down because what I thought was particularly brilliant about the bunnies was that she was using old makeup and a lot of the women who were in the group remembered how to do the makeup like they could pick up the cotton balls and put it on paper and so 
they were making things and she allowed them to, you know, she, she was playful and she said, okay, we're doing bunnies. And anyway, they, they, they were able to make these things. They were to be makers and artists. And then what we would do is that we had a, uh, a person in the community whose life had been affected by Alzheimer's who was a framer. And he framed all of the art and we had this art auction to raise money for the program. And we invited all the artists and their families to come. And what was magical about this one was when you would meet like young people whose grandparents were in here and they were rec they were being able to visit their grandparent and talk about them as an artist, not just somebody who's sick in the old folks home. And that was just a more, a, a, talk about a powerful humanistic moment. It was just wonderful. Now arts, this is now turning again with what arts and healthcare is doing. The first time that arts, and I, I, I learned this from going to these conferences because I knew nothing about arts and healthcare, Arts first got into hospitals because of wayfinding. I didn't even know that wayfinding was a thing, but wayfinding is a thing and you can get, you can take courses in it. And it's that people get lost in hospitals. And when you get lost in a hospital, you know, because you've got usually what, they just put up signs and put names on them with arrows and that's not very helpful. Um, and a lot of times medical centers, especially in, in bigger, bigger places, you know, it starts with one building and then it gets another building and another building that were all made at different years. It's not like a complete whole. So it gets very confusing very quickly. And so people were uh, getting lost in hospitals. That doesn't sound like it might not be a, such a bad thing, but it actually is. Like, and, and there's lots of accidents that happen because people are lost and running into each other or they're late. And there's a lot of missed appointments because people can't find out where they're going. So they brought the arts in and the designers in to try to make places that were not just aesthetically good, but that they had this function. So for example, um, you know, I'm sure everybody has a hospital experience where they're wanting to meet somebody and you might say, oh, can you meet me by the sculpture? Or can you meet me by the, you know, the healing garden? Or can you meet me? Or where, do, where is that doctor's office? Oh, well, you first have to go past. It's just something we do, you know, and we also use color. Like a lot of times in hospitals, you'll see different color on the floor. Um, at Miami Children's Hospital, where I, I would give CMEs, I just knew that the medical education office was the blue dolphin. So I would just always look for blue things in the corner because there's so much going on in the hospital so I could find my way. So there's been very creative ways to do that. And in particular, in children's hospitals, they've tried to get the artists in to try to make them to be happy, receptive places, not, not sad places. And then there are like, like, we were talking about arts therapy before, but there's been a lot of work with arts therapy and very, very, very interesting, innovative things with children's hospitals. Um, like there's something called Radio Lollipop, it, which is an international thing, which is a, a radio show that the, 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 that's facilitated and that the patients who are, you know, the long-term patients in the facilities can be, you know, who can be part of it. Um, art carts, like I never heard the word art cart before I got into this, into this movement, that uh, they'll take art carts around and have uh, folks be able to, to use the supplies and to be able to create. Um, one of my favorite groups is, I mean, this is another national organization, it's called Musicians on Call. And these are folks that are in the health professions who are themselves musicians, who will, you know, on call, it's kind of funny, right? Because, you know, being on call, I need music stat. Um, and I've known pharmacies in, 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 in hospitals that will have like a music lending section that's part of the pharmacy. Uh, and, and, and it's like a little funny thing about dispensing. Um, and this hospital picture that I'm showing right here is a Florida hospital. It's one of my favorite children's hospitals, it's Nemours. And the, the color of the rooms is something that the children are allowed to control themselves. They get to choose if they, which color they want to be to put their rooms in. So at night you have these beautiful, beautiful colors. And it just shows me when you go and approach these things that there is, there's happy, vital little people that are, that are in that hospital trying to get well. Um, another thing with music and, and, and visualizations, and this is a Nevada company, is Healing Healthcare Systems. Uh, and they um, put, it's called a healing channel. And what they studied was like, what kind of music relaxes people the most? Like, is it symphonic? Is it, you know, is it soft rock? Is it, and they, they did studies of it and found that some kind of like light jazz, almost a new agey, but not too repetitive would work. And what people responded to, to in a relaxation mode the most was nature photography. So they have paid artists, like they have paid, you know, they're paid practicing musicians and practicing artists to develop a channel that's in the hospitals 
instead of watching television, you watch this care channel, which is a, you know, it's, it's a healing channel that has the, this, this really relaxing music and really beautiful um, nature images. And it's in, in, in hospitals all over the country. And this is um, when we're talking about healing spaces, this is like a, a hospital in, in Reno. And when they built this tower, they did like when Vanessa was talking about like museum quality art, that's what this hospital did as well. Just they brought in, they, they made the investment for museum quality art and that's a healing garden that is made there. And the building itself is a beautifully designed work of art. And I mean, I have to tell you the number one reason why hospital administrators agreed to this is that they found out that people who, who were recovering in, in beautiful spaces tended to recover more quickly. And that means that the beds can turn over quickly. So the investment made sense to the administrators. So here's, here's the other, I mean, this is therapeutic too, but it's not therapeutic in the, um, like I can bill for it sense. It's in the humanistic quality sense. And it's, it's to look at arts uh, as an ability to be able to express oneself and to express one's, what one's going through. Um, and, and the experience of creating is a, is a wonderful way to do this. And so in this way, it's not just something that's for people who have certain kinds of things that need to be worked on, you know, cognitively or physically or behaviorally or emotionally. It's just about taking care of our own selves as human beings with over, you know, when sometimes there are things that overwhelm us and that's just part of the human condition. And again, when we're talking about human centered healthcare, it's the radical idea that not just the patients and their families, but providers are human beings themselves. And um, this is a picture, I mean, this is pre COVID, you know, and this is a picture that went viral on social media of a young emergency room physician who just lost a 13 year old patient who'd come into the emergency room and, and didn't make it. And he was just so overwhelmed um, by this loss that he needed a breather and somebody just happened to take his picture and it went all over the place because, you know, people were like astounded, my goodness, like, you know, you know, physicians care. And that's just so, so not, the, I mean, of course they do. It's just that these are moments that you usually are private, you know, and so uh, this went viral and it's to say, you know, after COVID, like I gave a talk, you know, the last the last presentation I get when we learned about the toll that this pandemic is taking on our healthcare workers, you know, and that one in five nurses are leaving the profession. This is this is something that's very um, much needed to be addressed. So, you know, burnout, it's not the same as stress. It's common. And as I said, this these stats were pre-COVID. But it's not just providers, it's also medical students, because medical students were my first concern as, you know, as a as, as, as person who's a medical student educator. Um, and it's a real thing. And I'm just going to share with you something. And again, this is pre-COVID. And this is something that came up on my social media um, by a former student who was in her second year of residency in surgery at the time. And I do have her permission. To, to show this. And interestingly enough, this, this young woman is from Henderson, Nevada. So she posted, she said, I usually don't share personal things on social media, but January was rough. And if the following is painful to read, it was painful to experience. In the course of three weeks, I not only got, I don't even know how to say this, uh, she got a kidney stone from dehydrating herself at work and running around. I got bad pneumonia. It was so bad that I kid you not, I cracked two of my ribs from coughing. And what did I do? I went to work. I worked my 30 hour calls in the ICU. I performed chest compressions on a gentleman at the height of my pneumonia during a resuscitation and never experienced longer than a two minute ACLS cycle in my life. And literally had to pull an inhaler out of my pocket in secret for two rescue puffs outside the room as soon as it was time for a new cycle. I wore lipoderm patches under my scrubs for two weeks for my cracked ribs, which now hurt worse than I ever and ever now that I had just used enough force to break another human's being another human being's ribs to keep him alive. So it's February 1st today and I have to call in sick tomorrow. And after all of that, I actually still feel guilty about having to do it because there are cases to cover and there are people to care for. And everyone reminds you of this when you call in sick. And if they don't, if we didn't remind ourselves because we're doctors and how could we forget the endless suffering out 
there. But there are always going to be people who need you, cases to be covered, etc. And as someone who is celebrating February 1st, because it means I survived January, I just want to remind everyone to take care of themselves, especially if you're a resident, because I think it's harder for us to say no, to not feel guilty. I think it's actually harder for us to care about ourselves because we're healthcare professionals. So let's, so it's February 1st and I've got something to say. Take care of yourself because you may care about your patients, but I care about you. And it's time we stop feeling guilty. This young woman was one of the most prolific writers in our student journal that I told you about. And nobody, she never got involved with any of the art stuff that we've done. She just would write and she writes magnificently. And I, I, I put this out because it's also, I mean, she just rattled us off. This wasn't something that she was gonna publish, but even rattling it off on a social media thing, you can see how well she can express herself and how important it is to be able to have an outlet to do that. So we've also done other things like, like we were, we, we, the, some of the medical students started to knit you know, and knitting is a beautiful thing. Like I know in the arts that there's this big difference between arts and crafts, making and creating something that's important to you. It communicates, it, it gets your mind off of things that are, are immediate. Um, and this, this is just, we did, uh, one of the things that we did, I worked with the, um, a perinatal bereavement group um, in a hospital and we got together with the, with the nurses, the, the labor and delivery nurses who were part of this, this group, but we, we had an intervention where we had a community arts center and they have all of these art making things for children. But we said, you know, why don't we, because it was the center was really close to the hospital. We said, how about we make an arrangement that one Saturday a month in the morning, anybody from the hospital, like from the perinatal unit can come over and we can just make art, like we can just create beautiful things. And that happened. So integrating art into your lives, it can be whatever you want to do, writing, journaling, painting, music, even if you're bad at it, there's something about the act of creation that's very therapeutic. And um, talking about writing, there was a, 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 an article I read that was very telling, and it was something about like, again, this is not therapeutic in the medical healthcare sense. This is therapeutic in the general sense that there's something about why, you know, writing is the opposite of something we call moral distress. And moral distress is different from burnout, but it's, it's a distressing thing. And that can be, I can do it at a talk, Vanessa, completely on moral distress. But let's just say it's a thing that's different than psychological distress. But the thing about distress is that the person undergoing it is perceived to not be in control. Whereas when you write, you're in control. Distress, when you're under distress, that's kind of a threat, like a perceived threat to values, especially moral distress. But writing can reaffirm your values. Distress undoes meaning, writing creates it. Distress might be seen to be always present and internalized, but when you write, you can externalize the event and put it in the past. Sometimes distress defies words, it defies communication. But when you're writing, you're actually using words and words are communicating things to other people. Distress is invisible, writing is visible. Distress can be isolating, but when you write, when you externalize, it's possible to share. So I just wanted to, you know, hopefully I've been able to convince you of something that, you know, and this is what I do. Like I've been a, a, a I was a co-director for medical humanities when I was in Boston. I was a director of medical humanities when I was at University of Nevada School of Reno. When I was in Miami, I started a division and I was a division chief for ethics, humanities, arts. And, I, and then I started to work with folks uh, in architecture. So it was the, the, um, the uh, division of ethics, humanities, arts and design. Um, and it, it really is not a luxury. You know, it really isn't secondary to practice or secondary to professional identity formation. It's important. Um, and so, you know, but if you want to be, if you want to be uh, uh, crass about it in terms of dollars and cents, like I already told you about uh, being able to convince hospital administrators to put a line, budget line in for arts um, because of the staff, or sorry, because of the patient turnover. But there's another thing and that's staff turnover, right? And time in the hospital and staff turnover. So here are some famous, you know, TV doctors that and that's again um, representation of medicine, but that's that's also for a different different talk. 
So I just wanted to end by saying, you know, when we're talking about humanities, arts, design, even in health professions, that um, what we've gone through tonight is that I've shown how the arts can make medical nursing dental students better clinicians. I've shown you how the arts can have like actual therapeutic effect, effects and that there are healthcare professionals who are arts therapists. There's music therapists, arts therapists, dance therapists, expressive arts therapists. Arts can educate about health and disease. For example, when I gave you the, the, the slides about graphic medicine, like when that's a way, or it, and any kind of writing is a way to, uh, uh, and painting to, um, uh, to educate about the first person experience of having a disease or the first person experience of caring for people with diseases. Uh, arts can improve the patient experience. That's um, when we talk about healing gardens, when we talk about having you know, uh, musicians on call. And just finally, arts can promote provider well being. So that's taking care of the caregivers, right? So that there's self care. Uh, and so that um, we can, uh, uh, if you don't take, you know, the, 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 that analogy of, of, of healthcare when, or healthcare provisal when they say, you know, it's like when you're on a plane and you, you know, you're, you're listening to what they talk about with the oxygen dropping down and that they say on the, on the um, instructional video. And remember, you know, before you put the, the mask on somebody else, you have to put it on yourself, right? You know, because you're not gonna be able to care for somebody else unless you're well taken care of. So I'm gonna leave you with these and I'll just hold this up for a little bit that, Here's some programs that I mentioned and other good things. So that's aligned to the narrative medicine program at Columbia University. Um, Amy Herman's Art of Perception courses and also that, that link will give you all of her books. Um, the visual thinking strategies, uh, as I said, that's, that's a major thing. Um, there's something called the New York University Medical Humanities Database and that's in particular for any of you out there who are yourselves educators or trainers in every way, that is just a, a, a vast, wonderful um, um, delight of different things that are going on around the country uh, with people using humanities and the arts in education. And then um, writing about medicine, Louise Aronson, she's, um, uh, she's, uh, she, she's actually the editor, like she's the arts editor, the writing editor uh, at the Journal of Family Medicine. And She's in California, and at that link, or if it used to be there, I mean, I haven't checked it recently, but her name is Louise Aronson, and she actually has a, a list of all the different places that you can, if you are a health provider or a health profession student, um, where you could get your own work published in writing. So whether it be your poetry or your short stories or a reflection, um, that's the good list. And so for again, for uh, folks who are interested and, and they are educators, the Cambridge Consortium of Bioethics Educators, and that's bioethics broadly construed. It also has to do with any kind of arts and design intervention. I'm the American Working Group Director for this international organization, but if you're interested and if you are somebody who has interventions that are interesting that you've studied yourself, um, they meet in Paris, which is not a bad thing. Um, then we also have the Academy for Professionalism in Healthcare. And they started out by uh, 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 a, a, a national grant and their whole MO is to use um, humanities and ethics in order to meet professional goals in health professions education. And medicine um, is well represented there, but so is dentistry and pharmacy. Then there's the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. And as Vanessa mentioned, um, I helped start uh, the group for healthcare profession educators. I'm now actually on the leadership board. I'm a, I'm a director at large for the National Leadership Board, but that's like kind of the academic conference for people who do this kind of work. There's also the International Health Humanities Consortium that has amazing stuff going on. And then there's the National Organization for the Arts and Health, but it's really in healthcare. And this is the national group where you'll find out more about what's actually happening in the healthcare spaces. So this is gonna be things like your healing gardens and your art carts and all the art therapy group is there. It's not really a group for um, people who are educators in the health profession, but you'll find out anything that you need to know, or if you yourself wanna to contribute to um, uh, arts, in, arts programs or arts making in the, in the hospitals. So 
to wrap up, I just wanted to say this is, uh, there are so many opportunities to incorporate the arts into healthcare and into health professions education. And so the value of arts is twofold. Like it's, it's, it's valuable instrumentally. And what I mean by that is, is that it's good because of the good that it brings forward, right? It's good because of the outcomes it brings. And so the arts and humanities broadly construed can bring about outcomes that are already looked for and needed in healthcare professions Edu or sorry, health professions education, right? So be it professionalism, be it communication skills, be it, um, uh, you know, resilience, resiliency, be it uh, 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 developing um, a good rapport with patients. So arts can be used to have those ends, the, the end, some of the ends of health professions education. But the arts is also intrinsically valuable. And what that means is that it's just a good thing in itself. And it's a good thing in itself because it can serve the creation is a good thing. And also the product's a good thing to be able to represent something about the human condition. So I've always said like, you know, when we have things and the arts are gonna be brought in, usually it's always just, you know, what can the arts do for medicine? Right, And the arts can do a lot for medicine and it can do a lot for medical education, but the arts has its own intrinsic value as well. So with that, I'm going to uh, sit back and, and I shall answer questions or if we can have conversations among the people who are here to perhaps learn about what they think about the value and importance of arts and healthcare. Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or feel free to put it in the chat, either way is fine. I'm going to kick us off with a question, Marin, if that's okay. I think we're often so, you know, we're taught that the math and science is one side of the brain and arts and humanities is the other side of the brain. And, and I think one thing we've noticed among our dental students and our dental faculty and our orthodontic residents is um, I'd say 90% of them are incredible musicians. And I'm sure you see that also in some of the medical specialties like plastic surgery or orthopedics. You know, why is that? How does that happen? And, and how common is that, that um, people have skills that really kind of are combined from really these very different areas? You know, people have remarked on the musicianship of health professionals a lot, mm -hmm. right? And there's I, I, a lot, like one thing I'm just going to say about this, and this was fun, there's, um, in Boston, there's something called the Longwood Symphony Orchestra, and it's composed of health professionals in the Longwood area, and that's where the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences was where I taught, and that's right across from Harvard Medical School, and, and you had to be good to get into this orchestra, because I knew people who were pretty decent amateur musicians, and they would audition for it. But no, this, this is world level, right? And what they would do is that they would play together, and then they would always take on um, a cause for the year. Like it could be, you know, um, Alzheimer's or ALS or diabetes or something. And then they all the proceeds to their performances would go to that particular cause. Um, and the NIH has, a, has, a, has, a, has a, an orchestra. Michigan, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, they have their, their hospital system, they have an orchestra. And, and so the, the, the woman, I can't remember her name, or I, think, I believe that her first name is Amy. Um, she at the time was the musician, like the, or the, the musical director for the Longwood Symphony Orchestra. She actually wrote a book on this, like on why it was. And so a number of different theories have come up. Like, and so some people just say, look at, um, you know, people who have been, you know, especially medicine, because medicine's a very, you know, very competitive in dentistry, you know, it's a very competitive field. And you have to kind of be preparing for this academically, like, you know, early on, right. And the families that tend to egg their, their children on to go into these very competitive fields also tend to be the parents that offer a lot of other kinds of, of, of um, opportunities for their children. And music lessons is one of them. Right, so that you have these kids who are being taken to like space camp and they're also taken to music camp, right? So that was one end of it. Other people talk about, um, especially with the hands, 
you know, like being able to do things uh, uh, very adroitly with your hands. And that's something that, you know, especially I can see in dentistry, right? You know, and, and um, I, I started this, I didn't have it in my slide deck. Um, uh, when I was at the University of Nevada School of Medicine, um, I started a, uh, a fourth year elective in, uh, uh, in an artist in residency program for medical students in a hospital that they had to attend to the world of a hospital as an artist and talk, you know, represented as an artist. And my first two students, and I was just looking up what year it was, and I believe it was 2008 was the first uh, year, and it was a graduating class in 2008, I had my first two students. One of them is a surgeon, and he was a painter. And I just remember saying to myself, I want to find out where he graduates from and where he practices, because any surgeon who's an artist, I know his scars are going to be great. <laughs> you know? so, um, so, so I think that there is something as well to that. But uh, uh, again, I mean, a number of different kinds of, of hypotheses have been put forward. But the fact remains that, that um, I kind of think that very accomplished people are very accomplished people all the way around. But to your other point, Vanessa, I do think that we've looked at things in terms of like arts versus sciences. And that's been referred to as the two solitudes, you know, and that they don't talk to each other. And it's been like my life's academic work to get that conversation going. Okay, do you have a question? Go ahead, Rick, now you're good. Okay, Jack. Hi, hi. Uh, <clears throat> this is Rick Smith. I'm uh, uh, not a healthcare professional myself. I am vice chair of the board of trustees for our Roseman University. And uh, <clears throat> I am very attuned to this issue. Um, I have a brother who is a psychoanalyst and uh, uh, also have spy boards in medicine. Uh, the arts are a huge part of his life, particularly reading and writing philosophy uh, in depth. And uh, it, it, as it, it, we've had talks about this as a, and, and my wife as well is a psychotherapist, uh, but the um, rounding of one's comprehension, understanding and empathic uh, abilities that <clears throat> are derived not through technique, but through technique combined with the arts uh, is a, um, uh, as it, it seems to me to be an essential component to uh, a holistic approach to, uh, to certainly to mental and emotional health care. And I, I, I don't separate the mind from the body. So I, I would assume that that would uh, apply to uh, all matters in health care. And if you would indulge, just one personal note. Um, my mother, uh, uh, my late mother, while she was alive, she was uh, a very, uh, uh, though an amateur, a very accomplished pianist who played a lot in, in, in church and uh, um, around the house and for friends, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, later in life, um, in her 70s and early 80s, uh, she suffered Alzheimer's. and. As the decline happened, her inability to communicate and uh, the, the downward spiral that so many of you are well familiar with in uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. But the one thing that she could do, she could still play chords on the piano. And uh, that is something that cert certainly as a son, I will never forget, but just as an observant, of that connection in her mind, in her artist's mind to her life, um, uh, something that uh, very remarkable. And I, I know that's not an isolated incident, but uh, anyway, so that was just uh, my input on this. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Aaron. This is a wonderful, wonderful topic. Well, thank you, Rick, I agree. and. Um, and you might have noticed that I had quite a lot of examples with Alzheimer's because I had gone to, like I said, when I was studying, I went to, the, when I was, at, there was a, a big conference at MoMA, and this was like, oh gosh, it was like 2009 or something. 
and there was a whole day on arts and alzheimer's and this is when i learned a lot about like the moma program and we actually brought them out to nevada like i said like to try, try to start a program and that's one of the reasons why i came to when i was visiting vegas was to work to try to get ruvo center interested in this um but there is some amazing and that's you know programs for it because like we like you've noticed with your with your mother that folks with dementia can still have aesthetic responses to things and music in particular is something that really really resonates and so it's about quality of life and it's about you know you mentioned about the the arts and and being part of 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 healing but it's it really and and, and to 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 address the the care of patients it's human right you know it's it's if we're going to be talking about humanistic healthcare you know, this is part of the human experience and to be able to talk about what's going on with you when you're going through illness is a very important thing, you know, and psycho psychoanalysis knows the importance of talk. Well, so it's I, representation in some form. Yes. While, while I couldn't communicate with my mother, uh, you know, in, in a verbal conversation, she could hit chords and I could just hum the chords. And there was a connectivity with between us that went far beyond <clears throat> just noise on a piano and noise, <laughs> in my case, coming from my voice, but a true emotional capacity there that we were able to tap into. It was, it was a most wonderful thing. If I may ask you, Maren, what was, uh, did you talk with Dr. Jeff Cummings at uh, the Rubo Center? Oh, no, I can't remember who I spoke to. It was It was a woman who was doing... Because I was working, I was looking for people who were doing anything with the arts, and uh, I can't remember her name. And well, as I, I said, that that somebody took me to the Nevada Cancer Institute to look at this particular arts collection. You know that now I get to look at every day, um, and the sculpture as well. You know, in the gardens is just so relaxing and beautiful. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Jeff Cummings and his wife are very, very involved in the arts in our community. And uh, I happened to run into them at the Smith Center uh, for the Performing Arts on Sunday, uh, Saturday where uh, uh, our daughter was uh, one of the featured performers. And uh, we talked a little bit about the arts and of course, <laughs> as a father, uh, about my daughter. But, <laughs> uh, but my point being that I, uh, I know Dr. Cummings would be very interested in hearing about opportunities to involve the Rubo Center with the arts. And I don't know, there may be some activity in that, to that nature going on now, but uh, I know Jeff to be very, very attuned to the arts. And I would be very surprised if a man of his uh, vast experience isn't connecting those dots very well. I, I'm glad to hear that. I'm really glad to hear that. Because like we were talking about, it's it's also the experience and the quality of life. Yes. You know, what I thought was such a beautiful thing when we were doing that arts program, which still exists at the memory care home, um, to have the families, like and in particular the young ones, you know, who were kind of afraid to go to these homes because the people just don't act in the same way and they can't act with their grandmother or grandfather in a way that they were used to. But when they saw them being makers and we also like we just didn't have the art, we also made like greeting cards with it. You know, like you can do that. You can get the images and make calendars and greeting cards. So they would the, the, the people who are the loved ones or the people who are in the memory care home would have these souvenirs that were made by their loved one. Mm. And this one woman just like a, it was a daughter. She wept. You know, to say that, that my mother, I haven't been able to speak to her, and now she can communicate through it with beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Erin, I have a, there's another question for you from another board member, um, but I would also throw, you know, gardening and um, cooking, baking. There are a lot of other, you know, artistic endeavors that probably extend to other areas. So, um, Mary Greer asks, to what extent are we going to be able to incorporate some of this into our College of Medicine curriculum? And how do we begin to um, share some of these successes and um, studies with more broadly across all of our programs and our program development? Oh, I'm so glad that somebody took the bait. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I would very Finally. much like to incorporate this. I think we can do it. Like I'm just looking, I was just looking at the last um, um, edition of the arts journal that we did at my last university. And um, I, I have to tell you, I think that having a Roseman student journal like this would be a good thing. And that's something that we could do interprofessionally. Um, I think that we could do uh, like what the University of Miami did is to have an interprofessional VT, like visual thinking strategies kind of intervention so that we could get students from all the health professions. So it could be like an icebreaker, but it could also be, you know, that they're just learning together and talking together about the paintings. And that's like a skill that can be transferred to other situations. So just off the top of my head, those are the two that I think that we could do on it. Like we could, we could do that so quickly and it would be so well. And then to have something like this, and we put this together at like a real journal. Like, I mean, not just a cop, like a photocopy of like some pages, right? Like we did a real journal and we, we, uh, this became something that every fundraising event we would have in our swag bag. You know, when people found out that this stuff was written by medical students, they couldn't believe it. You know, and it's like, there's some stuff that's not that great, but there's a lot of stuff that's really good, right? And I do think that we'll be able to do that as an interprofessional thing, especially um, with experiences like I said, at becoming a professional. So it could become part of the curriculum with any kind of professional development. Jack. Hi, Jack. Hi. Uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, it's, I grew up in an era and um, which is very, very different than now where we were all based in humanism and culture. Uh, there wasn't, I remember I grew up during the late 30s, 1930s, early 40s through that era. And there wasn't a day in, my, in our household where there wasn't classic music on. Three out of the five children uh, had musical training. Uh, you were constantly involved. Two of us got into the art field. That's what I got into primarily. In fact, I almost ended up at the School of Music and Arts in New York before I decided to go into medicine. Uh, but it was a cultural background that was there. And so the humanism part of this, of all these things, were almost a background built in. In fact, during my years in medical school, I remember a lot of my professors in their offices, there was always music on. There was always concert music on. It was a way, a background, they relaxed, et cetera. So it became a very, very useful device. And I think uh, Marin uh, really covered this very nicely, all of these areas. But there's an opportunity here. What's happened in the last 10 years because of the Brain Initiative, we're now starting to understand or trying to understand how does music really affect you? How does when you draw really affect your brain? Because if you can start to understand how that is, you can probably manipulate um, I hate to use that word, but you probably can manipulate how to use this for therapeutic intervention. Because right now we're doing it very empirically and we observe the positive parts, but we don't ever observe the negative parts of it. And so, so I think this is, a, this is a fascinating area where in the medical school, this would be a golden opportunity to start to look at the research ends of how these things really affect us. Well, that was that's really interesting, Jeff, because I know that there were some investigators at Harvard again, and it was in the brain right. places, and they were um, they received a bunch of grants to do this. And believe it or not, this is one of the and there's the oldest arts and medicine research institute is at the University of Florida, and they have a specific wing just for music and research, right? Um, in healthcare, and one of the studies was with um, premature infants and sucking. And they found that if they put like lullaby kind of music in the pacifier, like so that if the baby sucked more, they'd get more music and it worked because they wanted yes. the music. Yes. And so they yes. sucked more. <laughs> 
Well, there's a lot of those things that go on that we're using, whether it's art therapy or music therapy. Uh, in fact, there's a, an individual in Reno, I don't know if she's still there, Linda Peterson, who was an expert on the use of children's art and interpretation and became very famous in terms of uh, at trials where taking children's art and when they went on the stand, she could interpret actually what they were, and she was used as an expert in that area. I wrote a beautiful manual uh, that I, she was one of my faculty members at the time, I was chair in Reno. And uh, she, uh, a really interesting kinds of studies. And that's where it opened up the whole thing is, how does this stuff really work? I mean, that's the real basis, because if you can get it to work, then you might be able to take people who really don't have an interest in something and give them something or re reconnect their um, neurons so it does work. You know, so I think it's a, it's a great area. And it, it brings up the whole issue we're trying to, I think in medicine right now, the future is, you know, you really have to have communication. That's your basis. The most important thing in training physicians now is they need to be able to communicate. They need to be humanistic, okay? All the business about diagnosis and, uh, and how you make a diagnosis, what you do, that's becoming a, an AI machine learning technology. And it's really how you're gonna use that information to really uh, provide the best care for patients or rather how patients should receive the best care. Yeah, and another thing too, is that we've heard a lot about you know, STEM education, you know, like science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and right. slash medicine sometimes. Um, but uh, there's also, I know that Cheryl Brewster with the Aspire program that she's developing, like these pipeline programs, she's, she's, um, she's championing something called STEAM, which right. is the inclusion of the arts in this, because right. like, and there's a difference between creativity and innovation, but it's to develop creativity, like, you know, and to let it go, because, you know, you have to be, cre creativity is usually a necessary condition of innovation. It's not the same thing, but you know, it usually is involved, but you have to think differently. You have to think, you know, imaginatively. And so that's something that, you know, towards what you're saying, Jack, is that there's, there's a different way and approach to things that a more like rounded, like a more rounded training will give one, right? And when we developed, when I first did that, that intervention for drawing for informed consent, um, the biggest questioner was Dean Greer. And he said, you wanna do what now? Because you know, we all know the curriculum's a sacred thing. And if you wanna change something out, you better have a very good reason. And I said, well, you know, we have to teach people about, you know, communication, informed consent. And, and I was going on about it. And, I, and he said, well, we don't need this. They don't need, and I said, Dr. Greer. And he said, yes. And I said, you're a surgeon? <coughs> Yes. And I said, and if you're explaining the surgery to a patient, what do you do? Because, well, I get a piece of paper and I, and I went, yeah, you do. Yeah, draw it. <laughs> so I got, to, I got to teach that lesson in the curriculum. Well, medical student education curriculum is going to change or needs to change drastically. And I think we have an opportunity within this school to do something creative and innovative and not just adapt what's been done and to redesign the whole issue of what you want the students to be. And it's very clear to me, they'll have so much technology available. It's how they use that technology interpret it, and really how you provide uh, the best type of care for a patient and they should be able to seek the best type of care, you know, and getting out of our, you know, we gotta get into, a, get into an uncomfortable seat really right now and do things creative and innovative and not just adapt what has been going on for years. There's so much interesting stuff to do, especially in this area of communication. Great point, Jack. Rick. That was really well stated, Jack. Uh, uh, and the uh, <laughs> what an incredible opportunity we at Roseman have to do these innovative things because we don't have a track record of not having done them. Right. Uh, we aren't stuck with, uh, you know, the traditional modes of learning and uh, uh, those that are don't involve STEAM and uh, in a particular emphasis on uh, or a particular involvement of the arts. If I may give you one more, just following up, Jack, on one of your anecdotal uh, uh, pieces of information there, 
uh, I mentioned, uh, and I love to mention my daughter, 25, who uh, Ellie, who is 25 and a, a singer. Um, <clears throat> when Ellie was, when my wife was carrying Ellie, uh, when she was pregnant with Ellie, she had uh, classical music on all of the time in the home. Um, and uh, we were fond of saying Ellie came out singing, but uh, point truth, uh, she was born in September of 1996. Two months, three months later, my wife had Christmas carols on in the in our home. She called me at the office. She said, you're not going to believe this. I said, try me. And she said, Ellie is making noise to the Christmas carols that we're playing. And she says, if I stop playing them, she stops making the uh, 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 sound. Right. Now, she hadn't gotten all of the words down yet, but, but I, that, that connection is just, uh, how can we as human beings ignore that and not capitalize on that to the benefit of every human being? Uh, I can't imagine. So thank you, Jack, for your uh, uh, comments on that. Yeah, you know, actually, that's what I was getting at is, as you well know, education is a continuum. We've, mm -hmm. we've done our education in silos instead of as a continuum. So to me, the critical issue is for medical schools is what kind of student you, you want coming into the school? What have they done or what, where are they at in their educational process so that you can move forward and not suddenly say, well, this is what you have to learn. They may have learned a lot. They're gonna have a lot of technology, a lot of things coming in. So if you can set them up for success well, before they come into medical school, you can then start to capitalize on that success and take them to the next step. We always seem to be going backwards instead mm. of forwards. Yes, yes. Here, here. Okay, it's time for dinner, guys. Any other questions? Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? Thank you, Lauren. Yes, thank you, Dr. Gillis. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. This was a wonderful, wonderful presentation um, and a great one to go off to the holidays with and ponder. So thank you all and um, please stay safe and we'll see you back here in January. Good night. Good night.